And good afternoon to everybody joining us. We are here with MSI and Jesus Ramirez, who is a Photoshop expert. It, whether that is what you are or not, Jesus, <laughs> I'm running with it. Um, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so not many of us are. Um, so it's great to have somebody on who is going to show us all about mastering color and tone. I, I'm going to be honest. I was just thinking about this the other day about all the little ins and outs of Photoshop and when people do commercial shoots and product shoots and the difference in colors from one image to the next and how mm. um, I was talking with a buddy of mine and he was working with a client who was very particular and he's like, it's a pain in the butt sometimes to get everything uniform. And I'm like, you know what? That's why I'm just going to stick to what I stick to. Let the people <laughs> who uh, deal with color management handle that. So me personally, I'm super interested to see what you have for us today. I know everybody out there, it's a hot topic um, in getting your colors right, getting your colors uniform. So for anybody who's watching who does have any questions along the way, Jesus is going to answer them for us. So Jesus, welcome. Thank you to our sponsors, MSI. We also have Cody Hayes here from MSI, who is going to be answering any tech questions that anybody has. So if you have tech questions as well related to MSI products, feel free to drop those in uh, as well. So, hey, Seuss, welcome to the virtual event space, and uh, I'll kick everything over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me, and also thank you to MSI for um, being here with us today. Yeah, so we're going to be um, discussing color today, and color is really important pretty much on almost every project that I can think of. Even when you're doing black and white photos, you kind of have to think about how um, Photoshop will turn a color pixel into a black and white pixel. So there's a whole bunch of things that we can talk about. We can be here all day, but we only have a little under an hour. And what I'm going to focus on today is just several different projects, small projects in different types of areas uh, related to Photoshop, a little bit in photography, a little bit in compositing, a tiny little bit in design. I know we may have people watching that are in all sorts of fields, so I'm, uh, I want to give everybody just a tiny little bit of information. Um, one thing that I would like everybody to think about is if I'm showing a project um, that for example, one of the projects that I'm going to work on today is how to change, how to properly change the color of something in Photoshop. And you may never have the need to change the color of something in Photoshop, and that's totally okay. But what I want you to look at is look at the technique, look at how the tool is working behind the scenes, and think of how you can apply that knowledge to your workflow. So just try to figure out what I'm going to try to explain what's going on behind the scenes and hopefully that will spark some ideas for you to apply to your projects. So that's basically what we'll be uh, doing for the next hour or so. As I mentioned earlier, or you mentioned earlier, um, MSI is sponsoring this event and I am working with the wonderful uh, Prestige 15 laptop. Um, it has a lot of awesome features, but for creatives like, like myself, one of the most important features I think is the true pixel display technology that is on the screen. Um, it comes with a 4K resolution monitor, which is amazing, but again, uh, related to the topic, to, to today's class, one of the most important things is the Adobe RGB color representation at 100%, which means that you're going to be able to see the pixels on screen um, as accurately as you can, you possibly can. So that is one of the advantages of the device that we're using today. Um, if you have any more specific technical questions that I can't answer, um, Cody is here and he'll be able to answer any, any specific technical questions. And I'm sure that in the chat that you guys will drop the link to the laptop that I'm using. So um, with that, I, I think we can get started unless there's any questions or anything else that we need to go over before we start. No, we're good to go. Go for it. We're good to go. Awesome. So let me share my screen and... Awesome, cool. So the first thing that I'm gonna work on in today's example is just a simple color replacement um, technique. Now, before we actually get into that, I'm gonna show you a couple things that I want you to keep in mind. And also uh, towards the end, I'm going to show you the technique that most people use and why I don't use that technique and I use the technique that I'm about to show you. So first, the important thing, something that I want you to guys to keep in mind throughout this whole presentation. So I'm going to double click on the foreground color picker and that's going to bring up, of course, the color picker. And here you have several different um, color modes that you can select to um, choose a color from the color picker. So it doesn't matter what color I select, you can see that the values in these boxes change. Um, one of the most important ones, at least for today's presentation, is this box right here, the HSB. 
hue, saturation, and brightness. Uh, first of all, hue. Basically, what color are we talking about, right? Is it red, blue, green, yellow? What, what are we talking about? So that's what hue represents. What color is it? Next, we have saturation. Saturation is the intensity of that color. Is it really, really intense? So at saturation 100%, we're going to get the maximum intensity. Or is it not intense at all? And we're going to get a white or a shade of gray or black. So that's saturation. Then brightness, I think brightness makes a lot of sense for most people. Is it really bright or is it dark? So those are the three components that are going to make up basically every color that we see in Photoshop. And not surprisingly, this color mode is known as HSV, hue, saturation, brightness. So keep that in mind because that's going to be very relevant to a lot of the things that we're going to discuss in today's session. So let me just cancel this for now. And what if I wanted to make this couch a different color? The color doesn't matter. I have a yellow box here that I could use as a reference, but it really doesn't matter if we make it yellow, red, or any other color. So the first step that you want to do with any image, and I have all these different layers to show you different things. Don't worry about those layers for now. Let's just worry about the background. Um, the first thing that you need to do is select the area that you want to affect with an adjustment layer. So I'm going to be really, really lazy here and use one of Photoshop's newest tools, the object selection tool. I have rectangle as the mode and all I'm going to do is just click and drag over the couch and we'll see what good of a job Photoshop does in selecting the couch. What the object selection tool is doing, it's uh, using Adobe Sensei, which is Photoshop's or Adobe's artificial intelligence machine learning technology. So I created that box over the couch and it analyzed the areas that it thought were the main subject and it selected them. In this case, it did a fairly good job. You can see that it selected most of the couch is probably 90% accurate or so. So really, really good selection just for dragging over the couch and not really doing much work. So I like that. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, click and drag this layer into the new layer icon and duplicate my background layer. And actually, let me also go into my panels options and I'll just make a large thumbnail so that you guys can see what I'm really doing here in the layers panel. Anyway, so with this layer selected, this duplicate layer selected, all I'm going to do is create a layer mask. So now you can see what that selection looks like. Again, pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good. Next, I could paint with the brush tool using white to reveal pixels. So reveal the areas that I missed. And if I go over the line, I could always select black as my foreground color and paint with black to hide pixels. Obviously, I don't want to spend too much time fine tuning the selection and making it perfect because there's so many things I want to show you besides um, making a, a good selection. But let me just get it good enough for the example. One thing that I could do is come over into the layer here and from the properties panel um, right here, I'll have the select and mask workspace. I can click on that and I'll switch over into the black and white view so that we can see the edge. So what this panel allows you to do is edit a mask and you can see how the AI did a good job in selecting the couch, but the selection was actually pretty jagged. I can smooth that out really, really easily by dragging the smooth slider to the right, see how the jaggedness is disappear. I can push it even further if I want to smooth, that, smooth it out even more. I can also use the contrast slider to um, sharpen that edge, and I can press OK. Um, even though we can continue fine tuning this and make it even, even better by painting over it with the brush tool, we'll just call it good for now so that we can focus on the color matching technique. So I could always come back and make adjustments. That's the great thing about working with layer masks, that they're non-destructive. In other words, you can always edit them. So you can start working with what you have, and then when you know that it's going to work, you can come back and work on the small details. But anyway, let me enable the background layer so that we can get the couch back or the entire background. And then with this copy, I'll just call that copy couch um, so that I know what I'm working with. It's always a good idea to name your layers. So first, let me show you the technique that most people use, and, I'll, and then I'll tell you why I personally don't like using that technique. So um, you probably have seen a lot of tutorials in the past where um, the instructor or the person teaching you uh, tells you to go into the hue and saturation adjustment layer. You can use this icon here to clip it to the layer below. In other words, this adjustment layer will only affect the layer that's directly below it and nothing else. 
and I can make an adjustment, right? I can make the couch, for example, yellow um, or try to get it as close to yellow as possible. And then I can adjust the saturation. And this is where the problem comes into play. If I adjust the lightness slider, which will control the brightness of the image, notice that I get a washed out image. See that? I really cannot control the contrast of that couch. Um, this happens for a lot of reasons. One of the most important reasons is because we're using a different color mode than what we began with. If you remember, we were using the HSV color mode. This is using the HSL color mode. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but that's basically the reason why when we adjust the lightness, we just get this white couch or this like black couch, but we really cannot control the contrast. So in my opinion, um, this is not the best way of changing colors of an image. So usually what I like to do is I like to just start with these sliders, right? The hue and saturation and just find the right hue and the right saturation, but then use a second, uh, second adjustment layer to control the brightness of that couch. So what I can do now is click on the couch and create a levels adjustment layer. If you're more, uh, more advanced, you could use a curves adjustment layer if you like, but for beginners levels could be a little easier to understand and it works just fine. So what I can do now is use my input sliders on top or my output sliders at the bottom, and I'll explain what they do in a moment. But basically, um, once you have this adjustment layer, you can now control the contrast of that couch and just get a brighter yellow, but still maintain the shadows that are found in the couch and it doesn't look as washed out. And you can, of course, fine tune all of these sliders and to get the the result that you want, but the point is, is that this will give you a much, much better result than simply using the lightness slider in the bottom, because at, at some point you're just gonna wash out the image or just make it black without any contrast. So um, let me quickly explain what these levels sliders control. So the three on top, those are known as the input sliders. The, you don't have to remember that. The one thing you do have to remember is that this slider here, the one that's dark, that one controls what pixels are essentially the darkest color. The darkest color is black at the moment. So when you drag this slider over to the right, you'll notice that there's a gradient here at the bottom. So what Photoshop is doing is looking at all the pixels that are this shade of gray or darker and making them black. The reason that Photoshop is making them black is because the output, this one here, is on the black pixel. See that? So Photoshop on top is saying all these range of tones from this dark gray and darker will become the darkest pixel selected, which is black. But if I drag this one to the right, now the darkest pixel is no longer black. Now is this shade of gray. So what Photoshop is doing is taking all these pixels here in this range and making them the darkest color, which is this shade of gray. Um, so, that's how this works. And the opposite is true on the other side. If I drag this to the left, now Photoshop is taking all the pixels that are this shade of gray and brighter and making them the brightest pixel, which is white, because this is what this slider is pointing to, it's pointing to the white. But if I drag this over to the left, now the brightest pixel is this darker shade of gray, which is why that couch is darker. So as you can see, this tool gives you total control of the tone in the image. So it allows you to create um, the appropriate contrast that the color that you want requires. So that is how you can just get a really, really dark yellow and still have it not be washed out. Uh, I forgot to mention the center point. The center point um, controls the, the uh, midtones. You can think about, uh, about it as controlling contrast if you like. That's a little bit easier to, to think about, at least in, in your head. Um, and you can just give it the appropriate contrast to have the appropriate color. But um, using this technique that divides the color swap into two layers gives you much better control. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions about this. If not, we'll move on into the next example. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the differences between HSB and HSL, which is something I referenced in the middle of this example. Let me just open up another file. So we spoke about the different color modes just a moment ago, HSB and HSL. HSB, hue, saturation, brightness, right? And I already mentioned that hue is what color something is, saturation is the intensity of that color, and brightness is how dark it is. So that is a, a color mode. 
inside of Photoshop, obviously. But there's more than that. We also have the HSL that we saw earlier with the hue and saturation adjustment layer. And I'll delete these adjustment layers because we don't need them. Um, so if I create a hue and saturation adjustment layer, we'll see the HSL color mode. So let me show you what happens when you bring the saturation all the way down to zero. You get that result, right? You're expecting to get a black and white image, and that makes total sense. But what happens when we do the same thing with these gradients. And before I do that, I wanna point something out. The gradients that you see here, these gradients, when I enable the info panel and I hover over my image, you can see that um, if I were to change this into the HSV so you can see, you can see that the only thing that really changes for the most part is the hue. The brightness is about the same on, on all of them. So then that means that when I bring down the saturation, let me enable the properties panel and actually I'll pop the properties panel here so that we can see it and it doesn't pop and cover the image there. But if I bring down the saturation, you basically get more or less the same gray throughout the entire image because the only thing that was controlling the color was the hue but when we remove the hue, then the saturation doesn't matter. And then the only thing that matters is the brightness. So that, that's what we get. But watch what happens when I use a different adjustment layer that has the same slider. If I go into the vibrance adjustment layer, you're also going to notice a saturation slider. It's got the same name as this slider, saturation, see that? And most people expected to do exactly the same thing. But when I drag the saturation slider to the left, you'll notice that it doesn't do the same thing. In this case, you can see that there's different shades of gray in the resulting color. And that is because this adjustment layer uses a different color mode. So the math behind the scenes, the algorithm behind the scenes works completely different. This one here, it's using, a, it's using the color mode that we were discussing earlier, hue, saturation, and brightness, HSB while this adjustment layer here is using the HSL color mode, hue, saturation, lightness. And the easiest way to think about the difference of these adjustment layers is that HSB, uh, HSL, excuse me, which is this one here, HSL, you can think of that one as a more of a numerical type of way of interpreting color. Um, we, I mentioned earlier that the brightness was about the same. Um, so when you bring, that, bring down the saturation, the resulting color on all the different colors is going to be the same because the brightness is about the same. But with the HSV color mode, the grays are all different. Some are way brighter and some are way darker. And the reason is that this color mode is designed to be more like the way humans perceive the um, perceived color. So even though that numerically, all these colors here in this gradient have the same brightness, we as humans perceive blue to be darker than yellow. So when I enable this layer, you can see that the yellow looks way brighter than the blue, but numerically speaking, they have the same brightness. So that is the difference between these two sliders, and that is one of the reasons why in the previous example, dragging the um, lightness slider just basically washed out everything. So um, that's why I had to go in there and use the levels adjustment layer to give me more control of the contrast. So um, that is the biggest difference between these two adjustment layers that have the same name saturation. They do the same thing, but they do it with different math, a different color mode, so you get different results. So that's something very important to keep in mind when you're making adjustments to your images because you're going to get a different result. And if you don't understand what the difference is, then you may get unexpected results. And most people, to be frank with you, you don't really have to know all these differences, but it helps in some cases if you're not getting the result that you want. A lot of cases, and what most people do and it's totally fine is just drag the slider and see what it, you know, what result you get. If it looks fine, you keep it. If it doesn't, you try something else, and that's totally cool as well. But the point is, is that sometimes you come across problems and you're not really sure why something is happening. A lot of the times it's because of something like this where the color mode that Photoshop is using in a specific tool is different than what you have in mind of how color works inside of Photoshop. 
Um, I guess now that we're in this image, something else that I should point out is, okay, so that's great. Um, now I know the difference between what HSB and, H and HSL is with saturation, but how does that um, compare to vibrance? Like what is vibrance? Like if I, if I have the hue and saturation adjustment layer and increase saturation, this is a result that I get it completely, completely, completely um, blows out all the colors in the image. I mean, her skin tones look are natural. All, everything just looks so unnatural. You can see that this uh, blo these blocks here that had different levels of saturation, they just all become red, right? They all just become the same color of red. That is because saturation increases the saturation of all pixels equally. So it just blows everything out. However, um, vibrance is a smarter way of adding saturation. If I simply increase the vibrance slider to the right, all the way to the right, you'll notice that it will increase saturation, but this adjustment layer is designed to protect skin tones and to also protect colors that already have a lot of saturation. So you can see how this box here already had a lot of saturation, and it didn't increase the saturation that much, but the box down here at the bottom, it had very low saturation, so it increased the saturation further on those colors. Also, you can see in the gradient here that basically all the cool colors um, got added a lot of saturation, but the warmer colors, usually where the skin tones are in the yellows and oranges here, it got less saturation. So. If you're working on portraits, this is definitely an adjustment layer that you want to use to increase saturation. Um, the only time I ever use the saturation slider is if I bump up the vibrance slider all the way to the end and I still feel that the image needs a little bit of a pop, then I will increase the saturation on here. But generally speaking, to add saturation to the image, um, I would just increase the, saturate, uh, the vibrance on, on the entire thing. And if you are a little more advanced, I actually don't recommend just, just having one adjustment layer and increasing the vibrance all the way up. And that's because even though it's protecting skin tones and it's protecting already saturated pixels, you're still doing like an overall image adjustment. So what I would recommend instead is to right click on the layer, convert it into a smart object so that you can work non-destructively. A smart object is a container that allows you to um, apply adjustments, distortions, filters, and transformations non-destructively, which means you can always come back and edit them. So with this layer selected, I can go into filter and select camera raw filter. And that will bring up this window and actually, let me just get rid of, of that here. And in this window, I can go into the color mixer. And in the color mixer, you're gonna find this super cool color drop down here. I'm just gonna select color. And I can individually select the colors that I want to saturate. For example, I can select the aquas, saturate those, adjust how bright they are. Maybe I can shift the hue to a different kind of uh, blue. And you know, totally up to you. Maybe if, if I think her shorts are maybe too saturated, maybe I can bring down the saturation on that, maybe make them a little bit darker. So totally up to you. The point that I'm trying to make is that with Camera Raw, now you can target all these individual colors and control their saturation, their hue, and their luminance independently and not do an overall saturation. Uh, yeah, overall saturation using vibrance. And to be frank with you, if I was gonna do an overall uh, saturation or an overall vibrance, I still would do it in Camera Raw, and I would do that under the um, basic panel under vibrance and do it through here because then I also still have control over the color mixer and I can fine tune all these different colors accordingly. Um, let, me, let me know if there's any questions in the chat or in, in the comments. I guess we're good if, if you guys are right now. No, we're good for now. You can keep it rolling forward. Awesome, awesome, cool. So let's move on into the next example. I'm just gonna cancel this for now. I don't need to save any of this. And I'm gonna show you guys this terrible, terrible photo. It's like such a terrible photo, but it's perfect for me to show the next example. 
Um, I'm gonna show you guys an algorithm that in my opinion is the best algorithm to use to automatically color correct a photo, but unfortunately it's not on by default. You have to enable it. So first let me show you like what the def default algorithm is. And if I go and create a curves adjustment layer, I'll create a curves adjustment layer, obviously. And the, what the curves adjustment layer allows you to do is make um, the tone darker, make it brighter, and it also allows you to control the brightness of each individual channel. And what you wanna do with an image like this is you want to neutralize it. You wanna make sure that anything that should be a neutral gray is a neutral gray and it doesn't have a color cast. In this case, the neutral grays have a color cast of green. It's super obvious just by looking at the image. Um, if, you don't re if you really can't tell what color cast your image has, you can just hover over it with the info panel open. And right here, you can see the RGB, red, green, and blue. Red channel, green channel, blue channel. And you'll notice that 175 is what the value for green is, 114 for uh, red and 118 for blue. So clearly the green channel is just way, way out there. And the reason that I selected this part of the truck is, uh, of the truck is because it should be an off-white color with no color cast. It should just be like a really, really light gray. Um, but in this case, it's not a balanced gray. It just has a lot of light from the green channel, which is causing this image to look terrible. So one of the ways that you can fix this, or one of the ways that Adobe would like for you to fix this, and it's super easily, is by clicking on the auto button. And when you click on auto, this is the result that you get. And in my opinion, this is not the best algorithm to use. There's different algorithms that you can select. This is the one that's on by default. If you hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac. Again, that's Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and you click on the auto button, this window comes up and it selects, uh, it shows you the different algorithms that you can select to apply when you click on that auto button. By default, Photoshop uses enha enhance brightness and contrast. In my opinion, the best one is find dark and light colors. So I can select that one and I can also check snap neutral midtones. And I want Photoshop to apply this algorithm every time I have, uh, I want to color correct an image. So to do so, all I need to do is click on save as defaults and press OK. So now, next time that I create a curves adjustment layer and I want to color correct an image, all I have to do is click on auto and Photoshop will automatically color correct the image. In my opinion, this works most of the time. The few times that it doesn't work, all you need to do, and this is probably not the best image to show because it did work, but what you would need to do is select the gray point eyedropper and just click on a neutral gray. Some of you may be thinking, well, why can't we do that to begin with? Why can't we just you know, click on the gray point eyedropper and click on a neutral gray? Well, it does color balance the image, but you'll also notice that the contrast is off, the, the tires don't look as good, the um, shadows don't look as, as good, and that's because we focus on just balancing the colors, but we don't focus on the contrast. And what this algorithm allows you to do is find the dark and light colors. And what that means, and I guess I'll show you guys basically what this algorithm is doing behind the scenes. It's doing a little more than I'm gonna show you, but this is the basic idea behind them. Some of you may have been using Photoshop for, for years, especially if you've been using Photoshop before the Creative Cloud, uh, before CS6, which in my mind at least is like the modern Photoshop before, before that, um, the way to color correct an image or one of the ways to color correct an image would be to open up the curves adjustment layer and then go into the individual channels, the red, green, and blue. And we would need to find the data in the channel. So we can see the data here. This is what the histogram is showing. And if you don't see the histogram, you can go into the flyout menu, go into the curves display options and make sure that you have histogram enabled so you can see the information. Um, but basically what you would do back in the day is open up your curves adjustment layer, make sure that the histogram was enabled, and then just select your black point and drag it to the right until, until you hit the data here, until the data starts appearing. And then you would do the same thing for the white point on the green channel. And then you would do the same thing for every channel. In this case, the red channel doesn't really need to go to the right. It's fine there at the end, but the white point, I definitely need to bring it to the left until the data hits. And then I gotta do the same thing for the blue channel. 
I don't have to worry about the black point, but I do have to worry about the white point. So I can drag this to the left. And you can see that I'm finding the dark and bright colors of every channel. And when I do that, I start color balancing the image. See that, see how that looks much better? That's basically what this algorithm is doing behind the scenes is finding the dark and light colors automatically for you. And then snap it is doing the snap neutral midtones, which is gonna try to find the midtone pixel and make it neutral, which again, in my opinion, it gives it a, a better result. And the reason that Photoshop is making the darkest color black and the brightest color white is because that's why we selected here, black and white, and that's what's on by default. So I would recommend that you open up your Photoshop, hold Alt on Windows option on the Mac, click on the auto button, this comes up and just select fine dark and light colors, snap neutral midtones, and check the save as default box. That way you can quickly color correct an image with just literally one click like so. So I, I really, really recommend that you guys do that. Let me just get a little drink here. Um, next, since this is not really a compositing class, but since it's related to all of this, I'm actually going to show you something that I wasn't really planning on, on showing. So what I'll do is I'll, I think I have an image here that I could use that would really, really, um, I'm going to open up my, my libraries panel here. And I think I have a picture of, um, let me just do all my libraries. And I know I have a picture here somewhere of of a guy and he is looking away and we're gonna use it to color match um, a background. So this guy here, there he is. And then I know I have a photo of a sunny background. Let me just type in sunny or maybe just the word sun. And I should have something that will work great for this, this one here. So, um, basically, what I'm doing here is I'm going to composite these two together. It's not a compositing class, but it's related to, to color, so I think you guys will appreciate this. Uh, first of all, when, you, when you're compositing, you got to make sure that you get the, the right lighting. So the lighting in the background uh, is coming from the left. The lighting in the foreground is coming from the right. Well, that doesn't work, so I'll press Control T, Command T to transform, right click, and select Flip Horizontal, and there it is. That looks my, much better. So now I want to make it seem like this guy standing on top of this mountain, just looking out off into the distance. The sun is hitting him. That's why he's got uh, sunglasses. So what I'll do is I'll quickly, quickly remove the background by going into the Properties panel, and this is brand new in Photoshop 2020. Under quick actions, you have this remove background button. It uses the same artificial intelligence that we discussed earlier, um, but in this case, it'll just remove the background. What that means is that it's going to create a selection out of whatever the artificial intelligence thinks is the main subject, and it will also apply a layer mask just with one click. So let me show you how that works. Click on remove background, and Photoshop analyzes the image, and it looks fantastic. I think it, you know, did a wonderful, wonderful job just with one click. Obviously, we can go in there and continue adjusting the image to make it look uh, better, but I think that for the purposes of this session, this is very, very good. And what I'm going to do now is create a curves adjustment layer and clip it to the layer below. And the most important thing that you have to remember when you're using this technique or doing this technique is that you need to keep your focus, the white outline on the curves layer thumbnail. So I'm going to click on here and we have this selected right here, the layer thumbnail, not the mask, the layer thumbnail. And I'm going to do the same thing I did earlier. I'm going to hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac and click on Auto. And what I'm going to do now is use that same algorithm, use that same knowledge that we used earlier to color balance an image to now color grade an image. What that means is that we're going to apply a creative color correction. We're going to change the color so that it creatively matches whatever I want it to match. In this case, the background. It could also be, um, you know, just like you can think about a movie, for example. Um, a, the classic example is the movie The Matrix. It's got a green color tint to tell a story that they're in this digital world. So, you know, that's what a creative color correction is. I'm no longer trying to remove all the color so that it's a natural um, looking image. Now I'm trying to apply a color to tell a story. But we can use the same technology for that. So 
the first thing I need to do is uncheck snap neutral midtones because I don't want it to be neutralized. Second, I want to tell Photoshop now that the darkest color is no longer black. Now the darkest color is whatever the darkest color of my background is. In this case, like this dark orange here. And if, if I want it a little darker, then I can click and drag down and just select a dark orange. And I don't want the brightest color to be white anymore. I want it to be the brightest color of my background, but not a specular highlight or not the actual, you know, blown out white of the sun, just whatever, you know, yellow that is. And once I select that, you can see that Photoshop applies these colors to my foreground. I can press OK. And now Photoshop will ask me, do you want to now use these colors as opposed to black and white as default? 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't want to do that. So uh, press no. And all I have to worry about now is the contrast. So I can click and drag on the curve here to make it darker. So now the darker pixels are darker. He's um, He's backlit, so then he should be a little bit uh, darker than the rest of the image, and then maybe add a little bit more of the highlights just to create more contrast. And just like that, we were able to apply this creative color correction using the same um, knowledge that we learned in the previous example. Um, all we're doing is mapping the darkest and brightest colors to this person and then you can create a you know very convincing convincing composite just with a few clicks again using the same knowledge that we learned earlier and that's sort of the uh, the the thing that I was talking about in the beginning of the session where I said you may not be doing this type of project but if you learn how the tool works you might be able to apply it to something that you're doing um, and you know just use that knowledge to to help you in your projects but this is one thing, actually something that I should have mentioned before, and I guess I can do it in this image. Um, you also have to think about how blending modes relate to images when you're adjusting them. So for example, the classic example is that, you know, if you wanted to give an image contrast, you would do what's known as an S curve. Um, you make the darker pixels darker and the brighter pixels brighter. You can even use um, one of the presets like um, increase contrast and gives you basically an S curve, right? Um, whenever you apply a curves adjustment layer or a levels adjustment layer, you inter inadvertently add saturation. So I'm just going to create like a really, really strong adjustment just so that it's easy to see. So let me zoom in. So I just made an adjustment. It's obviously very extreme, but if you notice, I've added a lot of saturation to the image as well. And a lot of times when you're adjusting tone, you don't want to also adjust saturation at the same time. You usually wanna keep these separate. So one of the things that I recommend that you do when you're making a tonal adjustment to your image using an adjustment layer is to change the blending mode to luminosity so that you only affect the brightness of the image. And can you see the difference? So that's what luminosity, and this is normal. So luminosity, normal, see that? See how the saturation is much, much stronger in normal? So whenever you're making an adjustment with a curves adjustment layer that's only intended to affect tone, make sure that you change the blending mode to luminosity, and that way every, every adjustment that you make only affects the tone of the image, and not the saturation. Because in this case, even though the difference is, is neglig uh, negligible, you can still see that I'm adding just a tiny little bit of saturation. See that normal luminosity. And that's something that you may not want. So keep in mind, if you want to make an adjustment with the curves adjustment layer, levels adjustment layer, or any of these adjustment layers, make sure that you target the appropriate component from the hue, saturation, or luminosity. In, in this case, luminosity, and I can just make my tonal adjustments without having to worry about adjusting the saturation as well. Because maybe I'm already happy with the saturation, I just want to make a couple things darker and a couple things brighter, but I don't want to adjust the saturation. So using blending mode to separate the components is a really, really good idea. And actually, that reminds me of another thing, and maybe I can use this image to, uh, to show you. Another thing with blending modes and adjustment layers is uh, with the the, the uh, black and white adjustment layer. So with the black and white adjustment layer, you can make an image obviously black and white. There it is. And the way that this works is that you can take the original color of the image. Let's look at the blue on her shorts. And then you can make it darker 
or you can make it brighter. So th this adjustment layer basically makes things brighter or darker, right? And it does it to the black and white version of the image, but you can actually convert this to work with color as well. And all you need to do is the same thing, normal luminosity. And now I can control the brightness of those colors because I'm telling Photoshop disregard the hue and the saturation of this adjustment layer and only focus on the luminosity. So it just helps me control the darkness of my image. And a lot of times when you're working on these things, you might not even notice the changes just because some of these changes are so subtle, um, which is why it's so helpful to, helpful to sometimes work with the info panel and you can really see the numerical values shift. And also using devices like the um, MSI Prestige 15 that uses uh, Adobe RGB at 100%, you can really, really get um, true color representation on screen and it just helps you get um, everything as close as you can to what's in your head or to the output that you um, desire. Um, let me open up another image here. And while um, you're doing that, hey, Sue, so I'm just gonna, yeah. I'm gonna drop a link for our viewers. Uh, I'm gonna drop a link in the, uh, the comment section on Facebook. And if you are joining us here from Zoom, I'm gonna drop a link here. And this is for the modern series of MSI laptops. So if you guys wanna check out the modern series, uh, I'm dropping a link in the chat section. And on Facebook, I'm gonna drop a link in the comment section. Awesome. And uh, um, I don't, I, I'm sure Cody might know a little bit more about this than me, but um, if I'm not mistaken, these are Kalman certified uh, laptops, which means that they're, you're gonna get true color representation. Um, so definitely if you're somebody who's interested in color, um, this is definitely one of the better laptops that you can get simply because of the output that you get on screen. It's, it's, it's seriously one of the best. I mean, maybe you can, think of some really, really expensive monitors that might give you better color representation, but for a laptop, you don't, there's, there's really not much out there that, that performs uh, like this laptop does in terms of color representation. Um, cool. So what I'm going to talk about now, and we have, um, we don't have a lot of time, right? We have maybe like 10 minutes or something like that, 15? About 20 minutes left. Oh, cool. Okay. So a lot more than I thought. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, um, so I want to talk about one of the most powerful tools inside of Photoshop that I don't think that a lot of people take full advantage of, and that is because they don't really know how it works. And it relates to color and to tone, which is exactly what we're talking about in today's class. And um, let me just explain how this tool works and then you can take advantage of it. So this is just a gradient going from white all the way around to black. Very simple. And if I double click to the side of this layer, I can bring up the layer style window. And from here in the middle, you'll see the blend if dropdown. And by default, you have gray, and then you have the red, green, and blue channel. And what this allows you to do is to um, select the layer that you're on, this layer or the underlying layers, and then show or hide pixels based on whatever you have selected here. In this case, gray, in other words, the, the, the brightness of the pixels, right? So with the, this layer selected, I can drag this black point to the right and watch what happens. It starts hiding those pixels. And notice that this is a gradient here. So this is basically saying if the pixel is this shade of gray or darker, then hide it. And I can go all the way to the other side. See that? I think that makes sense. And then the opposite is true with the white point. I can drag this to the left and it hides those pixels, right? So basically what I'm doing here is if a pixel is this shade of gray, which is a shade of uh, 58, they, uh, the grays in RGB um, range from zero to 255 and this just happens to be a shade of 58. So if it's 58 or brighter all the way to 255, which is white, then hide it. So that's what this is doing. And there's also another thing you can do is you can click and drag on one of these points and then hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, click 
to split them in half and you get a smooth transition between invisible invisible pixels so really really cool right and you're like all right well that's cool like how can i use this well you can use this in so many ways for example if i i'm just going to use this image because it's the image that i have open you can use it to create a for example curves adjustment layer and maybe you only want this particular adjustment to only affect the highlights and not the shadows well how do you target the highlights and not the shadows well double click to the side of the layer and hide the effect from the shadows alt on windows option the mac click and split them in half this is probably not the best adjustment in the world but you can see now that this adjustment is only affecting the brighter pixels and not the darkest pixels in the image so this is how you can target specifically tones in your image also if you're someone who is doing compositing this could be like a really really a great compositing tool because now if I wanted to composite the word clouds onto this image I could use blend if to have the clouds pop up let me show you what I mean by that with this layer selected I can double click to the side of the layer and now I have again the this layer and the underlying layer now I don't want to focus on the layer that I'm on because right now I'm in the text layer I want to focus on the layers below and, it's, and obviously, since the layers are below, they're hidden by the pixels on top. So instead of hiding pixels, now I'm revealing pixels. I'm bringing pixels up. So with the black point, I bring up the darker pixels, obviously. And with the white point, I bring up the brighter pixels. So I can bring up the clouds. And I can also hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click, splits those points in half, and now I have this convincing effect of the clouds being in front of the text. And all this is editable. See that? See, I can just move it and place it anywhere that I want. And maybe I want it down here. But now this looks kind of weird. So I can always double click to the side of the, side of the layer and adjust those pixels accordingly until I get the, the result that I want. So it's a really, really cool um, technique that you can use to composite or to specifically target um, bright or dark pixels on a photo. The other cool thing about it is that you can also work with the luminosity or the brightness of channels, I should say. And if you go into the channels panel, you can see the red, green, and blue channel. This is obviously an RGB image. Um, basically, the RGB color mode mixes all this light to get all the colors that you see. So we have the red light, the green light, and the blue light. And together, they make up the RGB composite, the RGB view, and it's all the colors that you can see inside of Photoshop and basically every screen device. And what you can do now is look at each individual channel. And each individual channel is just basically like a black and white mask. And the white areas show all the light that's coming through in that channel, and the black areas show that there is no light coming through in the color of that channel. So for example, in the red channel, the top part means that we have a lot of red light because it's completely white. And the bottom part means we have no red light because it's completely black. When I enable the RGB composite, you'll see that yes, in fact, on top we have a lot of red. And at the bottom we have cyan, which is the opposite color of red. So we have zero red light. Cyan is the opposite. So um, in the green channel, we have white over here on the left and black on the right. If I enable the RGB composite, you can see that the reason that we have white is because this is where the green light is and the opposite of green is magenta and the magenta is on the other side, so it's gonna be completely black. And it should be no surprise to you that the next channel is blue. Blue is here, so then that will be white. The opposite of blue is yellow, so then yellow over here will be black. And yep, that's in fact what we see in the channel view and the blue channel view by the way um some of you may have inadvertently changed the um actually i thought it was right here i was going to show something and i don't even um, remember exactly where it is i think it's in the in the tools and i should have not even said anything because i'm not going to be able to find it on the spot because um, i don't have it enabled but um I thought it was under tools, but there, if you're ever looking at the channels panel and instead of seeing black and white, you're actually seeing the color of the channel, that is because the options have been changed. I thought it was under panel options, but I guess not. So it's definitely um, in the preferences under control K, command K on the Mac. 
And let me see if I can quickly find it. If not, it's going to be here somewhere. Oh, uh, here we go. It's under the interface, show channel and color. So when I click on that, you see now that the channel is blue. So if you're seeing the actual colors is because under the preferences panel, under interface, the show channel color option is checked. So you might have inadvertently enabled that at some point. So I know that confuses people sometimes where they can't locate the, uh, they can't see the channels in black and white and that could be confusing. But anyway, um, so with that knowledge now, now that we know that why, that all the individual RGB channels are just basically black and white images, we can go into the blend diff and watch what happens. If I double click to the side of the layer and I select one of the channels, red, what do you think will happen if I drag the white point to the left? Remember what the red channel looked like? We had white where we had a lot of red. So in this case, white is on top. The opposite of red is cyan at bottom and that's black. So if I drag the white point to the left, it hides those pixels, see that? And if I drag the black point, it hides the pixels at the bottom, see that? So black and white. In my channels panel, you can see that, that there, white and black. So that's, that's all I'm doing. So I can now select the green channel and do the same thing. See the black point is hiding the opposite of green, which is magenta. The white point is hiding green and all the channels that have a little bit of the, or all the pixels that have a little bit of that green in that channel. And I can do the same thing for blue. I can hide the blue using the white point and yellow using the black point. So how does this become beneficial to you? Well, again, you can use it as a mask. So if you're working on a project where you have a beautiful photo, but a really boring and dull sky, and you wanna do a sky replacement, well, instead of masking, like masking this tree will be, you know, very time consuming. It's got a lot of branches and leaves and a bunch of little detail that, that might just take you way too long to mask. What you can do is take advantage of what I just showed you. And you can double click to the side of the layer to bring up the blend if uh, the layer style window and inside of that you'll see the blend if slider and you can select the blue channel and because the, the sky is blue and let me just actually show you the channels panel usually in an image what you want to do is look at your image in the channels panel and just see what each channel looks like in this case the blue channel is pretty much dark everywhere but the sky because there's a lot of blue light obviously in the sky. So what you can do is select the blend if, select the blue channel, and then on the white point, you can drag this to the left. See that? See how I'm just like literally just hiding the sky super, super easy. I can hold the Alt key on Windows, that's the Option key on the Mac, split these points in half, and just create a smooth transition between visible and invisible pixels. And now I can just select the sky layer and just place it accordingly. Whoops, that's the wrong layer. Let me just disable auto select so that I don't accidentally select the layers I don't want to select, just the layer here at the bottom and drag up and just place this accordingly to make it as realistic as possible. Now, hey, Sus, hey, is that gonna give you any haloing on the leaves or minimal haloing? Excellent question. Excellent question. So the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on one thing. Let me just um, disable. Let me see. How can I how can I explain this? So the short answer is is yes. Um, the longer answer is it depends. If I zoom in, you can see that this particular sky and the background sky are pretty much the same. I mean, the one in the bottom might be a little bit darker, but in reality, they're they're very close that when I do the, the um, replacement here, you're not gonna notice the halo or it's gonna be very, very minimal halo because the both of the skies are essentially the same color. Now, you would really notice the halo if you're working with a sky that was maybe a lot brighter or a lot darker, then you will notice the halo. So what you would need to do in that case is select, I mean, basically what I just did here, you would select the, the, the sky layer, whatever the sky is, and adjust the sky so that, it, so that it more closely matches the original sky. And if you think about it, that makes total sense because the sky is literally was lighting up the scene. So if I bring a sky that is way, way too dark for that scene, then it's not gonna work. 
So, you know, you also have to find a, a, a photo of a sky that is close, uh, close in terms of brightness as to what the skies that you want to replace. And if it's not, then adjust it accordingly so that it matches the sky that you're working with. And not only would you remove the halo, but it'll just make a more cohesive composite because the sky should be a certain brightness because the, 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 the rest of the scene is a certain brightness. You know what I mean? I hope that made sense. Like, let me give you an yeah. example. Like, um, I think, I think we can probably use that same image we, we were using a moment ago. Um, so, oh, that I accidentally remove it. Yeah. So, so basically, um, I think I used the word sun earlier to find it. Um, so we were used, I think this will work. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but I think it'll still prove, to prove my point if it doesn't work. So maybe this is the sky that we select now, right? And I know this is probably not the best composite in the world, but here we are, right? So now you definitely are going to get a, a halo effect because you can see the halo is blue now because I'm using a completely different sky. Um, but if I were to either, I um, mean, this case, I probably wouldn't do this, but e either make the, the sky like a similar blue to what I had in the original image, then you wouldn't notice a halo, right? But in reality, what I would do in this case is actually change the, the foreground to match the background. So what I would do in this case is make a levels adjustment layer, clip it to the layer below, and then just probably um, completely, oh, actually this, this, com this shows me another thing I wanted to show you guys. Notice that when I adjust the brightness, the blend changes. Why does the blend change? Well, it's looking at the RGB channels. So when I make an adjustment, the blend changes. So I lose my, my blend. So how do I keep the transparency that I've created on a blend if adjustment? Notice the layer thumbnail here on the bottom right. You can still see the sky, the sky is blue. But if I right click on that layer and select convert to smart object, look at the layer thumbnail now is the transparency checkerboard. So that means that now with my levels adjustment layer, I can make it whatever color I want and I don't lose that, um, that transparency. So by converting it into a smart object. So what I did here is I just sort of matched the foreground to match the background. So that was a very long winded answer to, to your questions about the halo. Um, another thing you have to look out for when using this technique is, let me try to get it back to this image right here, is, in some cases, you can you may need to push the blue slider too far to get everything to look right, but that may start affecting other areas, especially if maybe you have a blue car or a person with a blue shirt, um, you may start affecting those areas. So what do you do in that situation? The problem is actually really easy to solve. All you do is you just duplicate that layer, Control J, Command J on the Mac, right click, and you can just um, remove the layer style. Did I not click on the layer style? Um, For some reason, that's not working. But let me try it again. Control J, Command J on the Mac, and I'll just do it the this way. I'll just remove the 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 blend if. But anyway, so now you notice that the icon's not there. So basically, I have my more original image back. All I would do at this point is just create a very very loose selection. I don't even have to be very precise and just select that barn, create a layer mask, and there you go. So you would just have to. Um, duplicate the elements that you want to keep on a new layer and put it on top. And doing that selection is a lot easier, as you just saw, than coming in here and trying to get all these branches. Obviously, I, I exaggerated there a little bit, but you know what I mean? I could just use this slider to fine tune it and get all those, all those branches, like so. Awesome. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you guys is I have here a color grading. We're going to talk a little bit. We haven't talked too much about color grader creating, but I wanted to, to talk a little bit about that. It just simply, um, one of my favorite methods of adding a color grade to the image, as I mentioned earlier, a color grade is a way of adding color to an image to help you tell a story as opposed to color balancing an image, which just means you, you got to get a neutral gray so that you don't have a color cast. Like in the, in the food truck, we had a green color cast. In this case, this image does not have a color cast. It's not, you know, overly yellow, overly blue, or overly anything. There's just a lot of gray going on, but it's kind of a boring image. But you can use a tool that I really, really like called selective color, and it allows you to select a color or tone and then add or subtract colors. And I know that sounds super confusing. The first thing you have to remember is the relationship between colors, RGB and CMYK. 
Remember earlier I talked about the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, and then the opposite colors, red, the opposite is cyan, green, the opposite is magenta, blue, the opposite is yellow. And if you're just starting out and you can't remember that, one of the things that I recommend doing is just simply creating a color balance adjustment layer, and you'll see that relationship here. And actually, I wish Photoshop did a visual representation of this in more tools, not just this one, but this one, they just do such a good job on it. You can see cyan, red, magenta, green, yellow, blue. There it is. So just for reference in case you forget. And where I'm really going to work with is the selective color adjustment layer. So that allows me to select the color and add or subtract um, one of these colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and their opposites, obviously. Black and the opposite is white. And what I'm going to do here is select the neutrals, which are the grays. And now I can add a little bit of cyan and just make it blue. Subtract yellow to get blue. If you remember, I'm going to go back into my color balance adjustment layer. See? Blue, yellow. So in this adjustment layer, I just have yellow. But I know that if I subtract yellow, I'm going to get the opposite color, which is blue. So I'm just making this blue magenta. I can just add a little bit of magenta. It makes it that um, purplish color, or I can add green by subtracting magenta and I get more of a cyan color. So I can now start color grading this image. So I'm creating that, you know, that teal orange effect. Orange because there's a lot of orange in his face, the yellow in the back, but everything else I'm making blue or teal. And the reason that blue and teal look great is because they're opposite in the color wheel. You see this a lot in movies, especially like in action films, where the actor is usually surrounded by a lot of blue um, and his face is sort of in the orange uh, colors. So that way it, it complements with the rest of the frame and then the actor pops. If you want to learn a little bit more about um, what I'm talking about, you can go into Window, Extensions, and open up something called Adobe Color Themes. And that's going to bring up essentially a color wheel. And what you can do in this color wheel when it opens is click on this icon here. It reads color rule, rule and you can select complementary. And then you can see that I have my blues and teals here, and then the oranges on the other side. So that's why um, this is often used in the movie industry, because those colors are complementary. And when you put col complementary colors next to each other, they tend to pop. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing here. And now that I have this selected color adjustment layer, I could also maybe make these tones a little bit darker by dragging the black slider to the right. And you know, you can spend as much time as you want fine tuning this. I can also go into the blacks and maybe add a little bit of cyan to the blacks, a little bit, uh, reduce the yellow on the blacks to get that tone that you get there. And now I can work on the skin tone separately. I can go into the um, reds and maybe reduce the cyan because I don't really want that much cyan in there. Sometimes you may inadvertently get cyan in the shadows. So then I usually like to come in here and just reduce cyan, add yellow to offset the blue and add a little bit of magenta and do the same thing for the yellows. And if you like oversaturate the image or something like that, you can always create a hue and saturation adjustment layer and just come in here and select the reds and then just desaturate the reds a little bit like so. Maybe do the same thing for the yellows or maybe increase them totally up to you. In this case, maybe I'll increase them because I'm not really affecting the, his face too much, but I do want the yellow in the background to pop a little bit. So maybe I can do that. So really quickly, just by targeting specific tones and applying or subtracting certain colors, I was able to create this super, super cool effect um, just with a couple adjustment layers. And actually, I don't even need this one. This one here was, was just a reference. And I know we don't have much time, but I do want to show you guys one last trick, at least maybe two if we have, if we have, if they give me an extra minute, but basically. Go for it. <laughs> awesome. Go for it. Now take what you need. Awesome. So, you know, maybe this is like a super, super cool uh, color grade that I've applied. I'm super happy. It looks great. And, you know, I love it. Right. So this is going to be like my signature um, color grade and it's going to go on my Instagram. It's going to go everywhere and it's super cool. So, so I want to save it. So um, obviously you could create a color lookup adjustment layer. So a color lookup adjustment layer is, is used in, in, the, in, in the film industry more rather than in photos. You can apply a color lookup adjustment layer in Photoshop if, if you want. And basically what these allow you to do is they're just basically like an Instagram filter, right? And you can just select the one that you like and apply it to your photo. And there it is. They actually have a teal orange one, but I like the one that I did much better. 
Um, so I could create one of those, but the downside is that it just becomes a regular adjustment layer like this one. And I can't control it, right? Like I don't, I don't really have no options. I can reduce the opacity and I can change the blending mode, but I can't really go in there and fine tune it if I need to, right? I can't come in here and, and adjust the red saturation to add or subtract or to maybe ch shift the hue a little bit so that the, the, so that the skin tones are are better, or maybe this is a different photo and it doesn't quite work and I just wanna fine tune it a little bit. So how do I save this so that I can apply this effect to all my images? And one of the things that you can do is that you can apply this to, um, oops, let me, let me change this, that you can um, apply it to your, um, uh, to your library here. So you can just apply this to your, to your library and you can see that I just selected the graphic option here because I had that layer selected and it created this thing called color, right? And you're wondering, well, what does that thing do? Well, I can drag it in here. And when I drag it in there, nothing happens. It's just like an empty layer, right? But what you can do instead, when you drag it out, is you can hold the Alt key on Windows, that's the Option key on the Mac, and it will drag in the folder that created that effect. So you see that here? If I just drag it, it's just an empty layer and it doesn't do anything. But if I hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click and drag it into my Layers panel, I get all those editable adjustments. So now you can create a Creative Cloud library call it like, you know, my favorite color grades. And then you can rename these, whatever you want. Um, rename it. I can, you know, I, I just called it color. Be, uh, Photoshop just called it color because that's the name of my folder. But I can come in here and just call it, you know, my cool color grade. And I can put this in a, in like, a, I can create a new library if I want to. And that library can contain just my cool color grades. And I can quickly just take any image. Let me let me just find a different one so I can show you here. So let me just um, type person, and I'm sure I have. Actually, neither of these will be good for that. Uh, let me just try man. Um, something that might work okay. Um, I, I'm looking for something that doesn't already have a color grade. That's another thing. Uh, I I made it so that the um, image would work with an image that has a lot of neutral gray. So like this one here has a lot of neutral gray. So I can, I can just drag this in there. Actually, I'll open it up. I'll open it up even better. I'll, I'll open it up. And then what happened to my color grade? Um, it's right here. So a whole new image, a whole, you know, let's just pretend it's a different day. This is my new, my new photo. And I want to apply my cool color gray that I apply in all my images. All you have to do is hold Alt on Windows, Option on a Mac, drag it out. And there it is. And since this image is a little bit different and she's blonde, well, maybe I, maybe I want to do something with the yellow. Maybe I can go into the selective color um, here, go into the properties panel and the yellows, maybe add a little bit more yellow to kind of make her, her blonde hair pop a little bit. Select the yellows here as well and then maybe saturate those more, you know, and, and just, just adjust them accordingly. And there you go. Simple as that. I apply the the look and feel that I apply to all my photos just like that. And the cool thing about using a, a libraries panel is right now I'm working with my laptop here, but maybe I move over to my MSI desktop over there. And since I'm logged in with the same account here as I am with my desktop, um, all the stuff that I put in my libraries will sync. So now I have this available to me everywhere, uh, everywhere I'm logged in with the same Creative Cloud account. If I go to a friend's house and I'm using his Photoshop and I can't log into the account, well, I could log into, um, and here's a laptop I'm using, by the way, the MSI Prestige 15 uh, from the BNH website. You can check that out. I'm sure you guys will place the link on there, but you can go into assets.adobe.com, which is a website, and you can see your files here, your libraries, and I, forget, I forgot what library I, I put this in. I put this in in the 1324 libraries, so I can just look for my libraries here. See, 1324. Here it is, and there it is, my cool color grade. So I can just download this. See, I can hit download, and this will download onto my desktop, and it's just gonna be a PSD with the, the layers else there. So I don't even have to have my laptop or my desktop with me. I can just go to a friend's house and just log into his computer, use his version of Photoshop, but just log into my Creative, account, creative Cloud account from my browser, and then just download that that uh, PSD, see, is this PSD right there? It, it'll just be a Photoshop file uh, at that point. And you can quickly save your color grades that way.
Cool. Let me know if there's any, any questions or comments in the chat. I'd be glad to answer them. I do have a comment. This is why I love my job. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now, this, is, this has been great and super informative. I, I wanted to ask something situationally. It's funny. As you were going over all that stuff in the beginning, I'm like, oh, man. I mean, first, you gave a technique that I've been doing another technique. And Photoshop has always been one of those things that's referred to as you can do a million different processes a million different ways. And there's no one way to do anything. There's no mm -hmm. 10 ways to do anything. But you gave me a process and a, that was way easier than what I've been doing. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, which um, one was that one? I'm curious now. Well, in the beginning, when you were talking about the, um, the hue saturation and lightness, your workaround mm -hmm. for that by using the alternate, the alternate uh, adjustment layer, it's like, yeah. I don't know why I never thought of it um, <laughs> to do it. So I've been, I've probably been doing double to triple the work when doing certain things like that. And I don't get into it very seriously, but when I do need to do it, I'll be completely honest. Half the time it's just doing Photoshop to troll my coworkers and friends. So <laughs> well, um, that's how I started. So I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask in that particular section for what you were doing there, um, there was a, I had done pictures for somebody and of course, they came back and they said, well, you know, she's wearing a dress and there's pit stains. So mm -hmm. she was sweating. The underarm was wet, obviously, but it was a different color. Mm -hmm. Is that something where that would that technique work on that? Because I it was just a nightmare for me to try to correct that. So the short answer is yes, it'll be it'll be more realistic if. So, so short answer is, yeah. And uh, I probably wouldn't start with trying that technique on something like that. The 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 only way I would I would do it that way is if the texture on on the shirt or whatever was just like super noticeable. But if it was something like, for example, if you took a picture of me now and hopefully I don't have any 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 sweats. I'm in California. <laughs> it's super hot right now. I think we just had like a record breaking day or something but anyway the point is is that um what i what i would do is i probably would just find like another section and then just like composite it in and kind of like manipulate it that way um and then use the blend if technique that i was talking about to target the the darker areas but that would only work if it was a, a shirt like this one where there's really no no the texture wouldn't be visible you know but if you had something that was very yeah. visible then i would go with, with what you suggested so it, it depends Okay. And also, right. also to be frank with you, if, if, if neither method worked with, with that, um, I would try, I don't know if you're familiar with frequency separation. I would try, try, try that in that situation, like as a, but that's more complicated. So. Exactly. I was thinking, I'm like, cause that was the problem was the texture of the dress was very, yeah. was very tough for, for clone stamping. It was one of those textures that yeah it's not conducive yeah. to a clone stamp so yeah well see but that's the thing like um with compositing it from another area you might be able to distort um for example like if it was this sleeve i might be able to distort it and make it look like this sleeve you know what i mean still keep mm -hmm. the same texture but you know you always can't do that because sometimes the texture it, it is what it is and you can't it's difficult to match definitely cool wow tons of information man I, I i'm gonna have to watch this probably two or three more times <laughs> i'm over awesome. here like <laughs> no it, it's uh i was over here texting people i'm like all right you got you gotta watch this you gotta watch this because these are all questions that i get all the time mm -hmm. and there's a million different things out there i want to take this time to plug your your youtube channel um i'm gonna drop the the link for those uh people who are, are watching but photoshop training channel on youtube um gotta check it out there's a ton of great information i think it's it's your delivery is it's just straight to the point it's very easy to follow so definitely thank you, thank I you appreciate for that, that. Jesus. thank you also like uh, there's another thing i would like to plug on on just just because i know there's a lot of people starting out and it's kind of plugging me but at the same time not really if you um if you are just a beginner and you want to learn some of the basics um obviously a lot of people start with lightroom as opposed to um, photoshop just because it's a little easier to to grasp but if you just type in like lightroom and then like adobe on google um, you're going to go into the um, product page for Adobe Lightroom on, on Adobe's page. And if you click under tutorials, 
um, and I think my screen's still being shared, so, so I think you can see this. You can see um, these courses, this beginner photo editing course and this local adjustment course on Adobe's website. Um, I, they're my videos. So I, I do a lot of work for Adobe and create a lot of content for their, their website. Uh, so you can come in here and these are free. It doesn't cost you anything. Anybody could watch them. All the downloadables are there and you can check them out. It's just like a beginner's course. Obviously my YouTube channel has a ton of content as well, but the course here is geared for like people that are just picking up, you know, like a camera for the first time. They just want to learn how to, how to develop their photo. So it's like the bare, bare basics of, of um, Lightroom. So I don't know how many people watching this stream fall into that category. Um, I was talking about some pretty advanced stuff. So that's you and you stuck all the way to the end and then good, good on you. But um, if you want to start with like the bare basics, just type in Lightroom tutorials, go to the Adobe website and you'll see some of my courses on there. And also talking about Adobe, um, one of the things I showed today, if you go on YouTube and you type um, Adobe Creative Cloud, um, you'll see the Adobe Creative Cloud channel. Um, and I also have content in there as well that is a little different than my YouTube channel. And one of the things that they just posted, um, actually it must not have been the creative chat. Oh yeah, here we go. The thing I showed you guys today, there it is, that couch. Um, it's also on Adobe's uh, YouTube channel because I also create content for them on YouTube as well as my YouTube channel. So on my YouTube channel, I'm posting contents, uh, content uh, two or three times a week, but then other companies, uh, hired me to also create content for them, such as MSI and Adobe and companies like that. Perfect. And I also dropped a link for those watching um, to the prestige series of laptops yes. from, from MSI. So definitely check that out as well. I mean, it's, it's definitely for what we're doing here, you want to have the right machine to be able to, to do it, especially when we're talking about having the right colors. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, the, yeah, the true pixel display technology is fantastic. I mean, I, I have everything set to, um, you know, like Adobe RGB. And I know that some of the, uh, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, Cody, but uh, I believe that you guys also, uh, it also does um, sRGB at 100%, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it depends on, on the type of work that you're creating or your output. For me, I have everything set to, to Adobe uh, RGB. Uh, so yes, so uh, they do offer, uh, offer close up to 100% Adobe RGB, like the model you guys are showing on screen. Mm -hmm. um, then we also offer different variances um, for those looking for a little bit, either a more cost effective or something uh, catered to their specific needs. Awesome. Yeah, and, and the, the the one the laptop that I currently have right now with me that's the uh, 4K display, and if I'm not mistaken, I know you have guys have a, a lower end that is not um, 4K, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. We have a 1080p model, mm -hmm. um, still offering the NVIDIA GTX 1650 for those heavy workflows um, through Photoshop and even Premiere if you guys are video editors. Yeah. Uh, I personally have the same model you do, Jesus. Um, okay. That I'm cool. actually streaming on our connected with you guys on. So with learning with what you just went, walked us through, I might actually be able to be somewhat of a Photoshop and show, <laughs> show off to my friends for fancy football. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. 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 Actually, you know what? I just thought about like the last thing I wanted to show everybody because I said I was going to show two things. It's only going to take 10 seconds and I'm sure you guys are going to love it. So at the end of my presentations, I always like to tell people that the Adobe engineers are are always starving. They're really, really hungry because they hide food inside of Photoshop. So let me show you guys how to get a banana, coffee, and toast inside of Photoshop. So you see the three dot icon here. If you click on that and go into edit toolbar, this is designed to edit the toolbar. But if you simply hold the shift key and click on done, you'll add a banana to your toolbar. So now you can freak out a friend when you get back to the office. I know people are in lockdown, so probably not going back to the office. But when you get back to the office, you can add a banana to your friend's toolbar when you get back to school. And the other thing is um, coffee and toast. So if you press control K on Windows, command K on the Mac to bring up the preferences panel, you can go into the interface. And then these buttons here allow you to change the color of the interface. But if you hold uh, shift and alt, that's shift and option, <laughs> you'll get toast. And you can also get um, coffee. They're, the icons don't do anything. They're just there for fun. But I like to show people the little Easter eggs that the engineers hide and the keyboard shortcuts to find them. And you, you can win a bar bit tell, telling people that there's banana <laughs> coffee and toast inside of Photoshop. <laughs> That is, that's great. Well, I have an, a running joke at my office with my boss of 
catching her off guard while heave a, a banana over the wall of the uh, her cubicle and scare the crap out of her. So, <laughs> I think, so, okay, I think so, this, I'm gonna have to do it virtually now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, this has been wonderful. I want to thank MSI again. Uh, Jesus, can't thank you enough. We're getting the comments pouring in that people just really found this helpful. So uh, again, please check out his channel. Uh, check out the MSI products. So we have. Um, if you go on the BNH website and just type in MSI, it'll pull up a whole host of, of products mm -hmm. there. And if you go on YouTube, Photoshop training channel, and as well as uh, checking out the Adobe channel for all the, the work that Jesus does for them as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, thank you guys again. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. We'll catch you all next time.